for Canada-China relations. I applaud your focus on Canada-China relations in general and today's topic of Hong Kong in all of its manifestations is perhaps the most consequential challenge in global affairs for nations to respond effectively. All countries need to engage in the very kind of national conversation that your committee is promoting about how to respond to China's rise. My comments today uh, will uh, focus on or reflect my perspective as both a, pol uh, a scholar and a former senior U.S. policymaker. I spent 25 years researching and writing about China uh, as both an analyst at the RAND Corporation and, of course, as a professor at Georgetown University. In the last uh, six years, I served on the staff of the U.S. National Security Council under President Obama as director for China and then as special assistant to President Obama and senior director for Asia. In today's session, I'd like to make three broad points about the Hong Kong situation. First, the international community should expect the situation in Hong Kong to get worse before it stabilizes. Beijing's actions in recent weeks are a leading in indicator, not a lagging one, of Hong Kong's deteriorating political trajectory under Beijing's hand. On July 1st, Carrie Lam announced the September Legislative Council elections will be postponed for a year, and on the same day, Hong Kong authorities issued arrest warrants for six activists based abroad, including a U.S. citizen, for, quote, incitement to secession and collusion with foreign forces. Then on August 10th, just last week, Jimmy Lai and several other media executives were arrested, as was Agnes Chow, former leader of the pro-democracy organization um, uh, Demos, uh, Demos Isto. Uh, these actions clearly signal Beijing has no interest in preserving the basic political freedoms at the heart of the joint declaration, the basic law, and ultimately the one country, two systems model, which collectively have been so important to Hong Kong's success today. The fact that Chinese internal security and intelligence services will now be able to openly operate in Hong Kong only increases the mainland's ability to use fear intimidation and ultimately coercion to keep the to keep opposition voices silent. Beijing's overall approach in my assessment is to use the national security law to separate politics from business in Hong Kong. It wants to preserve the latter while neutering the former. In short, Beijing wants Hong Kong to remain capitalist, especially the continued functioning of vibrant financial markets, but not liberal in its politics and therefore beholden to the Chinese Communist Party for political governance. Ultimately, this strategy will lead to, perhaps in a decade, the diminution of Hong Kong as the center for finance in East Asia. As the risk and constraints of operating in Hong Kong grow, global financial firms and non-financial corporations will gradu gradually reduce their footprint in Hong Kong as they move some of their operations onto mainland China and their non-China operations to elsewhere in Asia. Thus, Hong Kong will gradually become a quirky, nostalgia-laden version of a southern Chinese city consumed by the fact that its best days are in the rearview mirror. My second overall point is that the fate of Hong Kong will assume greater importance in global politics, largely by dint of its impact on U.S.-China relations. China's crackdown in Hong Kong will worsen the suspicion and mistrust at the heart of the U.S.-China relationship. More pointedly, it will fuel an incipient ideological competition between the United States and, Hong, uh, and China. Hong Kong will become a focal point for and symbol of U.S.-China competition over the value of liberal ideals. Indeed, Beijing's crackdown on Hong Kong could not come, have come at a worse time, as the U.S. is and will remain in the process of reassessing the nature of the China challenge and recalibrating its strategies and policies accordingly. China's treatment of Hong Kong has accentuated the differences in values between the United States and China. This is translated into a perception that China is actively trying to undermine liberal rules and norms globally, which in turn has produced a, a debate in the United States about whether China represents uh, a systemic rival to the United States and other democracies. My third and final point is that Canada, 
the United States and other major democracies need to stay engaged and active on the Hong Kong issue. Our country's voices and actions matter now and going forward. While our leverage to change the, change the situation on the ground is admittedly limited, there is much that can be done to shape the overall trajectory of Hong Kong, as well as to shape possible future actions by China. These actions fall into several categories. First, the United States and Canada should publicly and continually reassure the people of Hong Kong, as well as like-minded countries all over the world, that our governments will stand up for the protection of universal values. The Hong Kong situation will be a long-term challenge, and the international community, especially the United States and Canada, need to be organized for the long game, and not just focused on scoring points against Beijing's excesses right now. The two joint statements by the United States, Canada, UK, and Australia to date are important in this regard, as was the G7 foreign minister statement. Our country should broaden this coalition to include others, notably Japan, South Korea, and EU countries, the new international parliamentary commissions on China in the UK, in the EU parliament, and Japan offer an, another opportunity to send such signals. Second recommendation, the United States and Canada should take coordinated action to signal to China that there are costs for its crackdown. The logic of such actions is to give Beijing pause when it considers additional actions against Hong Kong. The recent decisions by several countries to withdraw from or suspend their extradition treaties to Hong Kong was an important first step in this regard. One notable idea being considered is for a group of countries to follow the UK in opening their do door to Hong Kong residents who wish to emigrate. A related idea is to offer scholarships to young Hong Kong residents who wish to study in the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, and elsewhere. Third recommendation. The United States uh, and China should work, um, excuse me, the United States and Canada should work with the international business community to find creative ways to preserve the unique attributes and identity of Hong Kong to the extent possible. Beijing must avoid actions that substantially undercut the business environment in Hong Kong, especially related to global financial institutions. Thus, it may listen to the concerns of local uh, and business leaders about restrictions such as internet controls and law enforcement actions that undermine business confidence about operating in Hong Kong. The business community in Hong Kong may be helpful in pushing Beijing to retain some of Hong Kong's vibrancy. My last and final point is that the US, Canada, and other governments uh, should work in coordination to take actions that disabuse Beijing from the belief that it could extend its coercion to Taiwan. I remain very concerned that Beijing could draw the, long, the wrong conclusions about the international community's response to Hong Kong, which over, long, over time could lead it to extend such an approach to Taiwan. Thank you for the opportunity to present my views today. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we'll go to Ms. Chung from the New York University School of Law. Ms. Chung, you have up to 10 minutes. Please unmute. Mr. Chung, Mr. Chair, excuse me. Mr. Chung. Mr. Chair, thank you for inviting me to give evidence today. My academic work at NYU focuses on authoritarian abuses of law in Hong Kong and elsewhere. I'm also a Canadian citizen of Hong Kong origin, and I practiced law in Hong Kong for several years. You've already heard at length from other witnesses about developments in Hong Kong. I want to underscore the specific importance of these events to Canada. Although my remarks focus on the National Security Law, or NSL, I should emphasize that other developments, such as the growing politicization of the civil service and widespread impunity in the uniformed services, are also deeply troubling. I will gladly address these topics in questioning. I will make three points today. First, events in Hong Kong are bad for Canadian businesses operating there. Second, Events in Hong Kong are bad for Canadian citizens, both inside and outside of Hong Kong. And third, events in Hong Kong directly implicate Canadian foreign policy priorities. One of the main attractions of Hong Kong for Canadian businesses is the perception that it maintains the rule of law. 
This is ultimately about not being subject to arbitrary exercises of state power, and it is about being able to anticipate with reasonable certainty what you can or cannot do. The NSL imposes a parallel legal system, one with poorly defined offenses, unaccountable secret police, and harsh penalties on Hong Kong. This system will displace the normal legal system whenever the authorities invoke national security. Simply put, whether normal law applies to you depends on the whim of the state. Even normal administrative institutions that businesses rely upon, like the company's registry, have been politically captured. Since 2014, several opposition parties, including Joshua Wong's party Demazisto, have been denied corporate registration, hampering their ability to rent offices or raise funds. For at least three reasons, political apathy will not protect the business community. First, businesses in Hong Kong face tremendous political pressure to support the NSL publicly. Second, businesses will be forced to choose between complying with the NSL and complying with other regulatory regimes, including US sanctions. Third, normal business matters may increasingly be characterized as implicating national security. For instance, any financial analyst whose conclusions could be interpreted as undermining public confidence in the Hong Kong or Beijing governments may be at risk of being prosecuted under the NSL. Numerous chambers of commerce opposed the rendition bill in 2019 because they feared anyone present in or transiting through Hong Kong would be rendered to the mainland and subjected to its criminal law system. Having largely failed to bring people in Hong Kong within the reach of mainland criminal law, Beijing has brought mainland criminal law to them. Events in Hong Kong also have grave consequences for Canadian citizens, whether or not they currently live in Hong Kong. There are over 300,000 Canadians in Hong Kong. All of them must now live in fear of the possible consequences of violating the NSL, which include being rendered to mainland China, prosecuted in mainland courts, and sentenced to life imprisonment. Even a brief reading of the NSL will reveal that it defines its offenses in extremely broad terms. In the circumstances, there can be no meaningful certainty as to what will or will not be treated as an NSL violation. When the Chinese authorities assert, as they have done repeatedly, that the NSL will only be used against a small number of people, they are implicitly admitting that they have extremely broad enforcement discretion. Yet they have said very little about how that discretion will be exercised or regulated. This is antithetical to the rule of law. The chilling effects of the NSL also extend to Canadian citizens within Canada. As has already been noted by other witnesses, the NSL encompasses acts done outside Hong Kong by people who are not permanent residents of Hong Kong. Consequently, any Canadian who might have to travel to Hong Kong, transit through Hong Kong, or take a flight operated by a Hong Kong-based airline now faces considerable pressure to self-censor. Canadian citizens like me should be able to participate in the Canadian political process without fearing reprisals if they travel to or through Hong Kong. Canadian citizens of Hong Kong descent are at particular risk. Many of them, particularly those living in Hong Kong, are also deemed to be PRC nationals under PRC law. As the PRC does not recognize dual citizenship, these individuals are at risk of being denied consular access in the event that they are detained in Hong Kong. Evidence also suggests that the PRC has coerced individuals into renouncing foreign citizenship or claims to consular assistance. On June 30th this year, a PRC court sentenced Sun Qian, a Canadian citizen, to eight years in prison for being a Falun Gong practitioner. She purported to renounce Canadian citizenship in the process, likely due to coercion by Chinese authorities. Similarly, Hong Kong-based booksellers Gui Min Hai and Li Bo of citizens of Sweden and the UK, respectively, have also purported to renounce foreign citizenships in circumstances suggesting duress. Canadian citizens with ties to Hong Kong must now consider what, whether what they say in Canada will be used against them in the event that they so much as set foot on a Hong Kong registered airliner. In addition, protests in Canada expressing support for Hong Kong have been met with counter protests and provocateurs and their participants subjected to harassment and intimidation. PRC consular of officials in this country have publicly praised such acts of retaliation. Events in Hong Kong also have implications for Canadian foreign policy. First, the NSL will inhibit the Canadian government's ability to obtain accurate information about developments in Hong Kong and China. 
any Canadian citizen based in Hong Kong may face prosecution for doing what I'm doing today. Second, China's conduct in Hong Kong reflects poorly on its willingness to abide by other international commitments. Since 2014, mainland and Hong Kong officials have publicly and repeatedly declared the Sino-British Joint Declaration to be a dead letter, even though it remains in force until 2047. The failure of the international community, Canada included, to condemn these repudiations has contributed to the climate of impunity under which the PRC now operates in Hong Kong. Against that background, one might reasonably wonder whether the PRC will abide by its other bilateral and multilateral commitments. Third, and most significantly, the ongoing events in Hong Kong are an acid test for Canada's willingness to uphold its commitments. For the reasons I've set out, the situation in Hong Kong threatens the personal safety of Canadian citizens in Hong Kong and in Canada. It also imperils Canadian businesses in Hong Kong. This country has an obligation to protect them. Perhaps more importantly, how Canada reacts to developments in Hong Kong will speak volumes as to who we are and what values we share. Our government is publicly committed to revitalizing the rules-based international order in conjunction with regional, bilateral, and multilateral partners. I hope that whatever steps the special committee recommends and whatever steps the government ultimately chooses to take will live up to these stated commitments to multilateralism and the rule of law. I'll now be happy to take questions and to deliver supplemental written answers if need be. Thank you very much, Mr. Chung. And we'll now go to Professor Ong at the University of Toronto. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm grateful for this opportunity to appear before the committee. Uh, let me begin with a statement of positionality. So my perspectives on the situation in Hong Kong are shaped by my work in and on China, first as a consultant and later as an academic since the late 1990s. I've been based at the University of Toronto for the last 14 years, the first and, and only academic position I've ever held. The national security law has potential widespread consequences. As a China scholar, I think about delivery of content over online platforms and preservation of the rigor and integrity of the courses I teach. I think about the safety of my students participating online, either in Toronto or from their home countries. I think about the feasibility of sustaining my own research agenda. I, I also think about my Hong Kong-based colleagues who are at the forefront of the battle against erosion of academic freedom. So the law's potential impact on the wider academic community who engages with Hong Kong and China is profound. But we should, we should also be mindful that this is not the first time the metal of the China scholarly community has been tested. The last time was in 1989. And yet we endure, we adapt, and eventually we continue to thrive. When the law was first proposed, my initial assessment was that it would merely legalize the underground repression that Beijing has applied on Hong Kong for over a decade. My own research suggests that covert repression through proxy, or those taken out of the public eyes, have been ongoing in Hong Kong for some time, such as kidnapping of banned booksellers and the Yuanlong attack in July 2019. However, recent events, I think, and um, unambiguously suggest that the law has actually emboldened and further legalized crackdown on freedom of speech and civil liberties. Furthermore, because of the law's deliberately vague wording, it has produced a chilling effect on Hong Kong society and beyond. It is a clear violation of the one country, two system principle in the basic law. However, moving forward, the situation in Hong Kong may go in one of these two directions. Number one, I think Beijing may intensify its crackdown, further eroding Hong Kong's autonomy and the space for civil society to operate. Number two, the repression may taper off after the initial round of harsh crackdown. One could argue that because the law is so new, its first set of application was deliberately harsh in order to set a precedent for, as well as to produce demonstrative effect on any would-be violators. So in my view, which of these two ways the situation will evolve depends on the value of Hong Kong to the CCP, to the Chinese Communist Party elites. Despite rising competitiveness of Chinese cities, such as Shanghai and Shenzhen, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange remains the most favorable venue for Chinese companies to raise capital. 
Furthermore, a recent New York Times investigative report suggests that families of the party elites own more than U.S. 50 million worth of luxury homes in Hong Kong. So I think this is an indication of the political as well as personal vested interests of Beijing's top elites in the continued prosperity of Hong Kong. These elites in turn form the core support base of President Xi's leadership. Losing this critical support will render the leadership vulnerable. So in many respects, Hong Kong and the new and the national security law are a double-edged sword for the CCP leadership. On the one hand, they want to introduce the law to stop violent protests from wreaking havoc on the economy, which will hurt their interests. On the other hand, the law will invite sanctions, which it has from the U.S., that will erode Hong Kong's attractiveness as an international capital center and a regional business hub. So far, I think the evidence on Hong Kong's economic competitiveness has been rather mixed. In the past six months, Chinese companies have raised more capital in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and deepened its investment in the, in the territory. However, revoking Hong Kong's uh, special trade status has actually raised the tariff levels that goods coming into and out of Hong Kong are subjected to the same levels as those from mainland China. And a recent poll by the American Chamber of Commerce suggests that four out of 10 companies are, plan are planning to move their regional headquarters away from Hong Kong. So this, move, this bring me to my next point, which is what actions Canada should or should not take. I think overall Canada should send a very clear message that we condemn the repression on Hong Kong and we stand by the people of Hong, of Hong Kong. However, in my view, whatever punitive measures we come up with need to pay careful consideration to the dual nature of Hong Kong to the CCP leadership. I think Hong Kong is a goose that lays the golden eggs, as well as a rebellious child that needs to be disciplined. So this is from the CCP leadership's perspective. If we impose measures that further erode the function of the goose, Hong Kong's value will diminish to that of a rebellious entity that we have seen examples of. And the consequences of that is obvious. So, so to put it plainly, if we kill the goose, we may end up hurting Hong Kong's quest for freedom and autonomy more than helping it. And my number two recommendation is I support uh, Canada opening its door to immigration, to welcome immigration and talent from Hong Kong. And number three, I think I also would recommend Canadian government as well as the university sector to offer scholarships uh, for students from Hong Kong. In the short run, I think we should be under no illusion that freedom of expression will return to Hong Kong or the people of Hong Kong will be given universal suffrage as promised by the basic law. Upon the signing of the Sino-British Joint Declaration in 1984, many Western observers had hoped that Hong Kong offers a beacon of hope that democracy will one day arrive in China through Hong Kong. And this has proved to be a pipe dream so far. I think we should be also under no illusion that maintaining trade with China, trade alone will push the country to become more open, as many had, had hoped when they supported China's entry to the WTO in 2001. Nor should we fool ourselves that we, sh if we afford China the respect the size of its country deserved, the respect will be reciprocated. I think the fate of Mr. Kobri and Mr. Uh, and Mr. Spavo, who have been detained by China for more than 600 days, suggests that this is, it is not a country that actually plays by the rules. The collateral damage of the pandemic that no country has managed to escape so far, I think further illustrates the externalities of China's authoritarian political system. So I believe that to properly tackle the situation in Hong Kong without addressing how we should cope with the rise of China. I think these two problems are deeply, deeply intertwined. So I'm pessimistic in the, in the short run. However, in the medium and, long, and, and the long run, I believe that the resilience of Hong Kong as a city and the people shaped by the fiercely entrepreneurial, creative and industrious uh, migrant culture will prevail. And I remain hopeful that a vibrant and free Hong Kong will eventually return. Thank you for the opportunity to share my perspective.
Thank you very much. And I want to thank all the witnesses, each of the witnesses uh, for being uh, keeping it under 10 minutes, which will allow us more time for questions. I, before we start questions, I just want to alert members, we probably won't have time uh, for the full two rounds uh, in either this or the second panel, because I'm going to try to balance the two and get us in at least close to our time. Uh, we'll begin with Mr. Jenis in the first round for six minutes. Mr. Jenis, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the witnesses. Uh, the, the Chinese government often tries to use a bogus cultural argument to justify its repression. And for that reason, uh, their, their efforts to snuff out freedom in Hong Kong are, are part of a strategy to try and, and take away freedoms enjoyed by uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese areas. Uh, of course, Taiwan is, is a similar counterexample. Taiwan shows how uh, uh, Chinese culture is very much compatible with freedom and democracy, and I was very struck by the sense that uh, this is one step into into Hong Kong, and then the next step uh, will be Taiwan. Uh, and and we saw a similar pattern of action uh, with, uh, let's say, uh, Nazi Germany going to Czechoslovakia and then and then to Poland. And uh, so I, I'd like uh, Mr. Medeiros, if you could speak a little bit to. To, you, you spoke about Taiwan. Uh, how do we arrest this process? How do we uh, respond to the situation in Hong Kong in a way that deters this this next step into uh, the in likely what is what is the next uh, aggressive action planned by the Xi Jinping regime? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent question. And I share your concern about what conclusions Beijing might draw. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that this is, you know, this is not the prelude to World War II. Um, there are important differences, historic differences in the situation. And the reason I raised Hong Kong is, be um, I'm sorry, the reason I raised the Taiwan question was because I was concerned that if there is sort of insufficient solidarity in the West um, about the situation in Hong Kong, then in the future, if the situation deteriorates over Taiwan, that Beijing could come to the conclusion that the costs were not, you know, were worth bearing. They really weren't that high, um, and that you know, America, Canada, the UK, Australia would eventually get over it. But Taiwan's a very different situation, uh, largely because it's physically separated from the mainland. Um, and uh, because it would probably take some kind of major military action to bring about uh, the type of you know situation in Taiwan that it has over Hong Kong. I mean, you know, mo most basically, you know, it it has sovereignty, and the yep. international community yep. recognizes it has sovereignty. So, it, it in terms of deterring actions on Taiwan, it fundamentally comes down to a sort of military security type of issue, which yeah. is a large you, feature of U.S. defense policy. Sorry. Yeah, if I can just just follow up, I mean, I I, I understand, of course, there's, there's always differences when you try to make analogies to historic events. But is it is it perhaps a better analogy, kind of the the, the Western response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, where perhaps uh, Putin had had larger designs, and yet by by inflicting significant economic and other consequences on Russia because of that invasion, uh, it didn't stop the the annexation of Crimea, uh, but it it slowed down what might have been intended. As a larger, larger advance, do you think that that lesson is applicable? Where if we have a strong, coordinated international response, and Canada played a leadership role in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, so if we have a strong, coordinated international response, we can uh, maybe it doesn't stop the current aggression, but it but it's more likely to, to deter future aggression by showing that that aggression has high costs. Uh, basically, I agree. Um, it, it fundamentally comes down to what are the best mechanisms, diplomatic, economic, and military, that will give Beijing pause about taking future actions. So something okay. that I've written about is I was concerned that the sort of moderate international response to the Russian invasion of Georgia yes. di didn't cause the invasion in the of Ukraine, but it definitely sort of created an enabling environment. It can. It was one of the contributing factors, and yes. I think yes. we need to be mindful of that with Hong Kong. But as I and others have stressed, 
you know, you don't want to shoot the hostage. Killing Hong Kong right now in your effort to deter some notional Chinese response to Taiwan in the future doesn't support our values or our interests either. Th so thank you. I think I, it's I, I, yeah. Th thank you so much. I think that the, the point on George is very interesting. I have a minute left. I just want to ask you one sure. more question about you spoke about a multilateral response. Um, everybody on this committee, every party believes that we want to have a multilateral response. My concern is that sometimes people use the need for multilateralism as an excuse to say we shouldn't act first. Oh, we need multilateral. So let's sit around and kind of wait for something multilateral to happen. Uh, but what I heard you say is that Responding in a multilateral way means that we start with the coalitions we have and seek to expand them. So we'd be prepared to take action right now in concert with the United States, and we seek to enlarge those coalitions, but we don't wait for some mythical complete coalition to emerge. What are your thoughts on that? Generally, I agree. The fact that the U.S., the U.K., Canada, and Australia have already started to act is a good thing, and I think adding South Korea, Japan, and others— uh, is smart. So it, I don't think it's a question of inaction. It's a question of how do you go bigger and broader in terms of participation. Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, Mr. Jenis. Mr. Fragiscatus, six minutes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to the witnesses. I want to begin with Professor Medeiros. And Professor, I only have six minutes, as you know. So if you could spend a couple minutes on the following. And it's a question not directly relating to Hong Kong, but it's important because Canada's foreign policy choices, even with respect to Hong Kong, I think will be shaped by the evolution of the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, recently, you gave an interview to NPR Radio in which you said the following about U.S.-China relations. Uh, the two countries have gone through some very difficult times in 1989 and afterwards, after the Tiananmen uh, uh, Square massacre, but it looks like these countries are increasingly on a trajectory to a long-term strategic competition. So where do you see the U.S.-China relationship going? Because, as I said, uh, it, uh, it does shape, I think, uh, Canada's foreign policy.